right, we're back. So today we're going to be tackling uh, module 18, looking at the non-visual senses, basically covering them all in this time. Um, as far as videos goes, additional videos that might help you out, if you take a look, there's a couple of crash course videos that might be helpful to you. Um, take a look at there. Uh, the, the, the one on homunculus is a, is a good example of uh, kind of like how the senses are laid out and things like that. So take a peek. Um, but beyond that, listen for the four uh, random facts, like always. That'll be you know that the quiz will be based off of basically. Um, don't forget to do the quiz for the uh, chapter itself. And again, we're doing module 18. So make sure if you want to follow along with the PowerPoints, you can pull those up on D2L or follow along with the book, whichever way you like. Okay. Or if you like to just sit and listen, excellent. But anyway, that's what we're doing. So module 18. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, let's get rolling. So slide two, the non-visual senses hearing. So we're going to focus on this one first. And we'll kind of work our way through um, the four predominant senses. So the hearing, taste, smell and and touch um so yeah first off hearing sound waves from the environment into the brain sound waves compress and expand air molecules uh ears detect these brief pressure changes so that's and that's essentially what, what hearing is um just as the eyes see uh different wavelengths our ears hear different wavelengths of, of vibrations traveling through the air um and that is what we got so Third, uh, slide three, the stimulus input, sound waves, part one. You have audition, which is the sense or act of hearing, right? If there's some sound, uh, that, that is causing a, a reaction in the ear. So audition is the actual experience uh, of your ear doing what it's supposed to be doing. Amplitude or the height determines intensity or loudness in sound waves. So the bigger, the louder it is, the basically the bigger the wave would look if you were, you know, observing it through sound waves. Um, length is the frequency determines the pitch. So the, the the closer together they are, the more high pitched it is, and the further apart they are, the lower it is. Um, so frequency is the number of complete wavelengths that pass a point in a given time. For example, per second. Right. Pitch is a tone's experienced highness or lowness and it depends on that frequency. Sound is measured in uh, decibels or dB. Um, so, so a zero dB would be the, the absolute threshold uh, that, that we are capable of hearing. It doesn't mean that there's no sound. Okay, you, you could actually have sound that you are even capable of sensing, like there is a reaction within the human ear, but it is below the point where we are capable of perceiving that sound um, as far as volume-wise. Um, so zero would be that mark, right? You're just below the point where you can hear it. 60 decibels is a, this, about the sound of an average conversation. Um, so if you're sitting having a, you know, having a talk with a good friend or something like that, you're talking at about 60 decibels. Anything that gets above 85 decibels, uh, if, if you are exposed to it for a prolonged period of time, it causes, it can cause basically permanent hearing loss. Um, so yeah, be, be aware of that. Uh, if it's getting loud and if it gets uncomfortable, you generally you're expecting it, you're getting close to the 85 mark. If it full on is like you, it's just flat out uncomfortable. It's not just starting to get uncomfortable. Um, you've crossed that boundary, right? You, you are now basically permanently damaging your ears. So, um, so let's keep rolling. Slide four, physical properties of sound waves. And these, again, look exactly like light waves, right? Um, so distance is going to affect the, the intensity of it as far as the pitch. Um, so closer together, you get a higher pitch, than higher pitch, right? And further apart is lower. Okay. Louder with the bigger and quieter with the smaller. And that's basically, if you keep that in your mind, um, you, you understand how sound waves work essentially. Okay. Um, we are born, so before I can continue on, we're actually born with the, our hearing is our most developed sense at birth. Um, it actually develops in the, the, the third trimester. Um, and so we are capable of hearing in the womb. Uh, and our, we actually start to form some memories even in the womb of voice, like voices and things that we hear. We, we will respond to those um, outside of the womb. Uh, 
<clears throat> so it's 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 actually the most developed of all of our senses at birth. And, and it's important. What, our capability basically at birth, and it basically remains the same, is the exact maximum potential pitch that a human voice is possible of creating and the very lowest possible sound that the human voice is capable of creating. Um, and that's about at the range of what we can hear. There are sounds below that, like giraffes and elephants and things like that produce sounds that are much below the, our, our, the pitch that we can hear. And there are some creatures that create sounds that are higher than, than pitches we can hear, like dog whistles, right? You can't really hear it. Most people can't really hear it, but dogs do. Um, those kinds of things. So we'll go with that. Next slide, stimulus input, sound waves, part two. This is slide five. Um, sound waves are bands of compressed and expanded air. So if, if you picture air like a curtain um, and you take that curtain and, you, and you, you kind of fluff it, that's essentially what a sound wave is. Okay, but it's the air instead of a curtain. So human ears detect these changes in air pressure. And so it's basically causing a woomph, woomph, woomph in the ear uh, and transfer them into neural impulses, which the brain decodes as sound, which we're going to look at when we look at the internal portions of the ear. Um, we, we can dive into that a little bit more as far as how it works and, and what that, uh, that, you know, all the bits and pieces. Um, sound waves vary in amplitude, which is perceived as differing loudness and frequency, which is experienced as differing pitches. Okay, it gets a little repetitive, but here we go. Slide six, the ear. Um, vibrating air or sound waves enter the outer ear, right, this little bit here, uh, and pass through the auditory canal into the eardrum. Um, and so the eardrum is, is it, it's basically just it's like the skin of a drum, right? And it's going to pulse with the, with the sound waves as they hit it. Um, so basically as the air pressure changes, it causes it to wiggle. Uh, the middle ear is the chamber between the eardrum and the cochlea, which contains three tiny bones that amplify the vibrations of the eardrum. Uh, one way you can kind of look at those is it's almost like the uh, an old, oh, what's the word, a, a chronograph where, where like, you know, the for Morse code. It's almost like that, okay? The eardrum, the, basically the ear pulses, the eardrum pulses, and it causes the, 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 those three little bones to basically vibrate against each other and causes reactions, okay? The cochlea is a coiled, bony, fluid-filled tube in the inner ear. It contains the nerve receptors. Um, that fluid is actually part of the, what keeps us in balance, right? When everything is going well in there, uh, it, it keeps you, it keeps you up. Uh, the inner ear, with the innermost part of the ear, contains the cochlea, the semicircular canals, and vestibular sacs. And so that's again, that's where we our balance comes from. Basically, our our body is looking at where those fluids are being pulled, and that way we can tell which direction we are. So if we sit in our heads, we can tell we're upside down because the gravity is pulling the fluids up, which causes it to feel. Um, like it's going up. If you spin, those fluids start to swirl in there and it makes you feel dizzy because basically your, your brain is having a hard time figuring out where which direction is up and down and left and right and all that, which is why you get dizzy until it kind of settles back down. Um, it's also why astronauts actually can get some severe uh, motion sickness because basically that fluid starts to float when they're out of gravity, which the brain freaks out about and makes, it, makes you sick. But um, So there you go. On that note, let's give the first random fact. Uh, so first random fact, a study at Harvard found that having no friends can be just as deadly as smoking cigarettes. Uh, and actually it has the same effects in a, in a lot of ways. The, the, the big one being that uh, there are certain proteins that, are, that basically cause the blood to form blood clots more easily. And those proteins are heightened if you have no friends and or if you smoke cigarettes. So if you have no friends and smoke cigarettes, I, I am sorry, figure out something. How do you make yourself better? Get, get, get off those cigarettes. Make some friends. Okay. Um, slide seven. Decoding sound waves. Sound waves strike the eardrum, causing it to vibrate. Right. Uh, tiny bones in the middle ear pick up the vibrations and transmit them to the cochlea. A coiled fluid-filled tube in the inner ear ripples in the fluid of the cochlea bend the hair cells. Now, hair cells, scientists are really not very creative of, of things, right? They're like, a giant black thing in space that sucks everything in, we'll call it a black hole, right? We don't, we don't really, science is, doesn't, we're not creative. But hair cells are basically just, they look just like what they sound like. It's a bunch of little tiny, teeny, tiny hairs. Um, and they line the surface within those, those uh, the liquid, okay? And when the liquid gets vibrated, it causes just like, if you picture like seaweed in, in the ocean, how it moves with the, uh, the currents, these little hair cells do exactly the same thing, okay? 
um, with, as the currents of the fluid in the ear move, it causes these little hairs to twitch and move. Those little twitches and movements of those hair cells send an electrical signal down into the, 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 basically through the nervous system into the brain, which is then read and, and transformed into uh, sound and our perception of sound. Okay. So axons from these nerve cells transmit a signal to the auditory cortex where it's then interpreted as voices or a car driving by or a bird singing or all the different things that we can possibly do. Okay, slide eight. This image you can also find in our book on page, what page would it be? 217, um, down at the bottom. It's all the different portions of the ear. Um, remember too, the left ear actually is going to be connected to the right side of the brain and the right ear is connected to the left side of the brain. Um, don't ask me why, that's just we seem to be crisscrossed all over the place. But the sounds come in, vibrate the eardrum, which then causes the hammer, anvil, and stirrup to, to basically vibrate off of each other. The stirrup causes pulses in the uh, cochlea, uh, which then causes a current to begin to flow, which is then, depending on the speed of the current, will, will, will affect those little hair cells um, differently. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> uh, nine, the ear, since uh, sensory neural hearing loss or nerve deafness is damaged to cell receptors or associated nerves. So you can have, there's, there's all kinds of different ways you can basically wreck your hearing, okay. Uh, sensory neural hearing loss is essentially the, the ear is working fine, but the part of the ear where, where it sends the messages to the brain, something at that stage has been damaged and no longer basically sends the signals. Okay, if you look at like old black powder rifles, it's almost like if, if, if the nerves were like a black powder rifle, your powder got wet. It can't fire. Okay, um, that's the same thing here. A bow and arrow, your string broke, right? Something happened where everything else is working like it should, but it can't, it can't get that signal to go to the next thing. Um, and if that happens, it, you basically you, you, you lose all hearing, even though your ear is working fine. Uh, conduction hearing loss is damage to the mechanical system that conducts sound waves to the cochlea. So any of those little bones could get broken. Um, you, you know, they're teeny tiny little bones, right? The eardrum could get damaged. Um, all of those could potentially uh, take your hearing at different levels. Okay. Uh, cochlear, if that happens, you can do a cochlear implant, which is the device for converting sounds into electrical signals and stimulating the auditory nerves through electrodes threaded into the cochlea. So, there are, they now have devices, um, very intense hearing aids basically, that they go in and it implants itself uh, in the inner ear. And it basically, it overrides the, the loss uh, by, by conducting the electrical impulses and gives you a, a sense of hearing. Okay. Um, so yeah, you look at, uh, part of the, the, the different kinds of hearing loss too is, um, the little hair cells actually are one of the easiest things to damage. So there are <clears throat> there are approximately 16,000 hair cells in your ear. If, if they move as much as an atom's width, it sends a signal. Okay. Now with that much, much with that much of a signal, you're not going to be perceiving very much sound, right? Like it, you might not be perceiving any sound, but it is sending a signal to your brain, even with the teeny tiniest little motion. Okay. Um, if you've ever been to a concert where you hear, uh, ringing afterwards, or if you've ever like went to a firing range or things like that, and you've been around or worked at machinery and there's a ringing sound after you're done, um, that sound is a form of hearing loss, uh, that's basically caused by you, 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 you have overexposed the, uh, cochlea. So basically there's too much happening. It causes too big of a current. Okay. Get back to the seaweed thing, right? Too big of a current and the seaweed gets ripped up and, and torn away. And that's what happens to the, to the hair cells. The ringing in your set, in your ears is actually those hair cells snapping and getting laid down permanently. Uh, if you've experienced a, a loud sound that caused your ears to ring, your hearing is not as good now as it was before that. The instant you hear that ringing sound, you have permanently damaged your hearing and it will never be as good as it was before. Um, so if you're going to be going to like loud concerts and things like that, I, in today's world, who knows when that is going to happen, but bring some cotton or something, right? It might not look cool. I used to, I was always the nerd that had cotton in my pockets when I go to a concert. 
Um, and all my friends made fun of me right up until about two or three songs in and they were like, Hey, you got some extra, right? Protect your ears. Like that, that is super, super important. Um, so if you, if you know, you're going to be somewhere going somewhere where there's a lot of sound, get something to protect your ears. Okay. All right. 10 perceiving loudness, pitch and location. Part one. Um, responding to loud and soft sounds. So the brain interprets loudness based on the number of activa uh, activated receptors. Basically, the, the, the more cells that are, are moving, the hair cells, the louder the sound is experienced. Because basically, there's, it's, it's kind of like, right, I could touch you gently or I could jab you. It's, it's the same point of pressure, but it depends on how many nerves are being fired off and how intensely. That's what's happening with your hearing. The, the more, the louder the sound, there's more intense the vibrations in the air, the more, in, the more hair cells are firing off, which in our brain interprets as loudness. Okay. So soft tones activate fewer cells. There's less movement. There's less current happening in the ear. Louder sounds move more. Okay. So people who lose all hearing in one ear often have difficulty locating sounds. Um, and this is mostly due because of the fact that it, it um, it has to do with the fact that both ears, just like two eyes, allow us to see things in depth. Two ears allow us to figure out where things are happening. Our brain does an amazing amount of math amazingly quickly. Um, and it figures out the, the amount of time difference for a sound to enter one ear compared to hitting this ear. So if a sound is to my right, it comes into my right ear. And it takes a split second to make it past my head and get into my left ear. And it does the math and figures out it's that way because it hit this ear faster, right? If it's directly in front of me or directly behind me, it does the quick math and it's like, oh, it's about the same. So it knows it's it's one way or the other in that case, okay? Um, so if you lose hearing in one ear, you could still hear things perfectly fine, but you'll lose the ability to figure out where that sound is coming from because you only have one point of reference, okay? Slide 11, perceiving loudness, pitch location part two. Um, hearing different pitches. So place theory and hearing. It's a theory that links the pitch heard with the place where the cochlea's membrane is stimulated. It best explains high pitches. So this is going to, depending on where it is basically in the ear, um, the hairs are going to be slightly different in these are different areas. Um, and so it'll it'll affect. Some, some hairs are shorter, some hairs are longer, and each one will be affected differently by different pitches. And so depending on which ones are fired up will allow you to experience the difference of heights and lows in, in sound frequencies. Um, frequency theory is the temporal theory in hearing. Theory that the rate of nerve impulses traveling up the auditory nerve matches the frequency of a tone, thus enabling its pitch to be sensed explains lower pitches. Um, so these are basically combined to, to, uh, to give an overall uh, explanation of how we experience both higher notes and lower notes. Okay. So how we locate sounds, uh, number 12, slide 12. Sound waves strike one ear sooner and more intensely than the other. I already talked about that. From this information, our brain can compute the sound's location. Um, the image that you see here, you can also find, where are you? Ah, on page 218. Um, but this shows kind of approximately different sounds, right? So like a whisper is about 20 decibels. Threshold of hearing is zero decibels, right? Normal conversation is 60. Um, a busy street corner is about 80. So it, it, that's why traffic, a lot of traffic can actually be uncomfortable um, to be around. You're right at the edge of damaging your ears, okay? Um, a subway train at 20 feet is about 100 decibels. Uh, a jet plane at 500 feet is 110 decibels. Loud thunder, when lightning is like, crack, boom, kind of a thing, can hit 120 decibels. And if you ever go to a rock concert that has amplified at close range, it's generally about 140 decibels. That is damaging your ears like exceptionally well. Okay, there's a reason why a lot of old rock stars can't hear anything to, at all today. Um, a few notes before we move into the, the next senses too. Um, uh, this is also why a lot of times older people will, you'll, you'll, you'll lose certain pitches. Okay. The older you get, the first, the first sense of sound to go, um, is, I'm not sure why I wear long sleeves. I always run the them up, but anyway, um, the first sense, the first state of sound to go is actually the higher pitches. You're, you're going to lose the higher pitches much sooner than you're here to, to lose the lower pitches. 
Um, those hairs are a little more fragile, and so they break sooner. Um, I'm going to find a video. I'm going to share it with you all. I, I don't have it in there yet, but it's going to be there. By the time you see this, it'll be there. Um, there are videos on YouTube on like aging your ears, and you can, you can it, it plays different levels of pitches, and it, it ages you basically when you can finally hear it. Um, when I was a kid, when I was 16, I had my first cell phone, and I found this ringer that had a, uh, it was an, a, a, an adult proof ringer. <clears throat> and it was a super high pitched, annoying sound, like super high pitched, right? Drove me nuts. Um, I used it though, cause I was like, maybe it works. Okay. Uh, I found that phone about maybe two years ago. And I was like, oh, cool. <clears throat> I wonder if this still works. And I, I, I hit the ringer sound thing. I was like, oh, it doesn't work anymore. And my son who was six or five at the time was like, Dad, what's that annoying sound? Okay, and I was like, oh great, I'm an adult, right? Um, it plays a super high pitch, and basically by the, by about the age 25-ish, uh, that, that ringer can no longer be heard by most people. Okay, it'd be very rare for a person to hear it. Um, even, if you, even if you protect your ears like crazy, there's still gonna be just degra degradation over time. Um, but I'll find a video, it, you can see if your ears are on par with your, your natural age or if you have a little better than normal or if they're maybe a little worse than normal, but yeah, kind of figure out where you're at. It's a fun, fun little experiment. Um, so watch for that. It'll, it'll, it might be in the announcements or it might be in the content um, on here. We'll see. Maybe I'll do both. But anyway, it's a fun one. Um, but also, so the higher pitches, that's also, that, that's actually my reason for that saying that one. Um, older people a lot of times might have a harder time hearing uh, girls or women's voices um, compared to men's voices. And that can be, it, it's not because they're being like chauvinist or anything like that. Um, it's legitimately because they're hearing of the higher pitches. It's more challenging for them to actually hear and perceive accurately the sound of a woman's voice versus that of a man's voice, which is, you know, naturally tends to be lower um, overall. So interesting facts. So if your grandpa is like, what? To all the girls and he can hear the boys perfectly fine. He's not intentionally being a jerk, usually. He might be, but generally. Um, he probably just lost his hearing. Okay. Okay. On that note, uh, let's go with the next random fact. All right. The world's smallest mammal is the bumblebee bat, and it weighs about the same amount of a U.S. dime. Itty bitty, teeny tiny. There you go. Bumblebee bats weigh the same as a dime. Um, okay, slide 13, the other senses, touch. So we're moving away from hearing and into touch. The sense of touch is actually a mix of four distinct skin senses, um, pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. And those are basically all of the sensations of touch that you experience are those four, a combination of those four things. Um, other skin sensations are variations of these basic four. Okay. Um, so pain, women are actually more sensitive to pain than men. Um, so it, it generally, again, this isn't like 100%. You can find some dudes that have like no pain tolerance. And you can find some women that have amazing, exceptional amounts of pain tolerance. Um, but generally, women actually have more pain receivers than men do. So therefore, they experience pain at a, at a heightened level compared to men. Um, pain sensitivity depends on genes, physiology, experience, attention, and surrounding culture. Uh, you might have experienced where you've cut yourself and you don't realize you cut yourself until all of a sudden you notice there's blood and you're like, where is this blood coming from? And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm bleeding, right? And then all of a sudden it starts hurting because you've just paid attention to it. Um, that can be that attention factor, right? Um, I think I mentioned before, I think I did in this class, we'll see. But anyway, uh, I had a friend when I was a kid and we, we, we were riding bikes and he wiped out bad, scraped himself up, terrible. Um, and I was like, you okay? And he's like, I'm fine. Right? No, no tears. He was totally fine. Right up until he walked in and saw his mom and then he just <laughs> bursts into tears. Um, culture, right? The, 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 that aspect of things is going to be there. Um, some people have an exceptionally high pain tolerance. I, I seem to be one of those people, unfortunately, that has an exceptionally high pain tolerance where I get hurt and don't realize it, um, until I suddenly see it. I shattered my leg. Um, when the doctor was like, what's your, you know, on a scale from one to 10, one being, you know, no pain, 10 being worst pain in your life, what would you experience it as? And I was like, it's like a four or five, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's not terrible. I was like, it shoots up every now and then they're like unbelievable. But at the same time, most times that he's like, most people would be like screaming because it shattered literally into like multiple pieces. But, um, 
Yeah. Good thing in that moment. Bad thing when it's more minor injuries that I don't realize I hurt myself and I keep hurting myself because of it. So, um, so yeah, that's some different levels of sensitivity. Uh, gate control theory is the spinal cord contains a neurological gate that either blocks pain signals or allows them to pass on to the brain. Um, <clears throat> basically, if it if it's if it's useful to feel the pain, your brain will your your spinal cord and your brain will generally let it flow through. If it's not, it might block it intentionally, right? Unconsciously, but intentionally. So the gate is opened by the activity of pain signals traveling up nerve fibers, and it's closed by activity in larger fibers or by information coming from the brain. Um, example, I, I know a gentleman who he fought in, in Vietnam War. Um, at one point he was uh, running toward the helicopter. Okay, he was, they were in the middle of a firefight. Um, his friend had just got shot, so he grabbed his friend, threw him over his shoulder, was running to the helicopter, and he tripped. <clears throat> he, his leg gave out on him, and he just stumbled and fell forward, and he's like, that's weird. Picked himself up, picked his friend up, kind of staggered. He's like, oh man, I must have twisted my ankle or something. Staggered the rest of the way to the helicopter, got to the helicopter, unloaded his friend, climbs in, looks down, and realized half of his thigh was missing. He got hit by a 50 caliber machine gun round um, and had blown most of his left leg off uh, above the knee. Like So between the between the knee and the hip basically was, was at least half of it was missing. And at that point, his brain flooded with unbelievable amounts of pain. But before that, he basically felt no pain. <clears throat> he literally thought he had just tripped. Okay. The brain is like, this is not useful at this time. You need to get to safety, right? So block it, keep you moving. Once he got to the helicopter, he felt he he sensed he was safe now. His brain's like, okay, let's pay attention to that now. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's part of the gate control theory. 15. <clears throat> Biopsychosocial approach to pain pain. Remember, there's always three parts: psychological, biological, and then the soci sociological side of, of how we experience the world. So biological influences, activity in spinal cords, large and small fibers, uh, genetic differences in endorphin production. So if you have a, if you are lucky and get more endorphins, you might experience pain as pleasure, um, right? Like, so you're experiencing the pain, but at the same time, it's not, doesn't seem as bad to you. The brain's interpretations of the central nervous system's activity, uh, all of these things are, can affect the physical experience of pain. Um, psychological influences are going to be like attention to pain. If I'm focused on it, it's going to make it seem more ouchy, right? Uh, learning based on experience, uh, and then your expectations of it. If I think it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt more than, than it actually should, right? So I have an exceptionally high pain tolerance example, but I have a weird fear of getting shots. I just don't like it. it absolutely terrifies me for some reason. I know it's not going to hurt mentally, right? But I, in the back of my mind, in the actually in the unconscious part of my mind, I think it, 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 my brain is like, you are going to get like stabbed by a harpoon. Um, and so I always tense up and I'm like freaking out a little bit in my head before a shot. And then I get the shot and I'm like, oh, I didn't feel it. Like almost every experience of shots basically have been that. I can still remember a time when I was about five years old, I got a tetanus shot and it hurt so bad. And I'm expecting that same thing to occur again. Okay. My expectations influence how much pain I feel. Okay. Um, social cultural influences are going to be like presence of others. This can make you feel more pain more intensely and or make it feel less intensely depending on the poop, the, the poop, the people, <laughs> the people who are around you. Um, so yeah, <laughs> don't be surrounded by poop. Um, you know, it, so, so example, again, my friend who crashed on his bike when it was just me and him, he didn't feel as much pain because I wasn't going to show him very much sympathy, basically. Uh, when he saw his mom, he knew that, you know, his mom was going to, like, baby him, basically. He, his mom tended to do that. Um, and so he burst into tears because that would give him the, the comfort that he was wanting. He probably experienced more pain, actually, in that moment than he did before. Um, empathy for others' pain can actually cause pain within ourselves. Um, so this is an interesting one. They've actually done research, and they, they've hooked up people to, to brain scans and things. Uh, fMRIs and the like. And what they found was that that people who are, uh, if I have a loved one specifically, somebody who I feel connected to in some way, shape, or form, who is experiencing pain, um, there's different parts of the brain that, that fire up when you're experiencing pain. Some of them are actually the physical response to the pain, but there's another area of the brain that, that responds emotionally to the pain. You feel pain both physically and emotionally. 
Um, if you have strong empathy for someone else and they're experiencing pain, the part of your brain that fires up when you're experiencing the emotional portions of pain fires up even though you're not actually experiencing any pain physically yourself. Um, so you actually can experience another person's pain to some extent. Um, cultural expectations are also going to be a thing, right? Like, are you from a group that's like cowboy up, suck it up, you know, um, kind of background, or are you, uh, you know, you're like, you're like, what is it? Embrace the suck kind of a thing. Or, or do you just like give into it and, you know, <sighs> immediately, uh, as soon as you get hurt, all of those things combined, all of those different possibilities and categories are going to com come together for your own personal, unique experience of pain. Okay. Slide 16, the pain circuit. Sensory receptors, uh, nociceptors, respond to potentially damaging stimuli by sending an impulse to the spinal cord, which passes the message to the brain, which interprets the signal as pain. You Basically, your, your nerves are getting damaged and they start sending a signal. Okay. Uh, spinal cord reacts to it first. You might have a reflex where you pull a, pull away from the thing that's causing pain um, before you have the conscious thought of ouch, right? Um, but then it goes to the brain and the brain interprets it as painful. It, in some cases, can also interpret it as pleasure, okay? Sometimes some, something that hurts, that one person would see as painful, another person might see as pleasurable, like getting a tattoo. Needles aren't my thing, right? So that, that sounds terrible to me. But uh, I have friends that are basically, they, they love it. They, they, they get, because they have a, 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 a different floodings of different hormones and things that basically, uh, to them, it's all worth it. Um, to me, it sounds like a nightmare. But then anyway, that's, you know, differences in, in how we experience pain. So, <clears throat> okay, 17, controlling pain. Um, placebos reduces the central nervous system attention and responses to pain. So remember, a placebo is is a, a fake thing, right? Like a sugar pill or something like that. And I tell you, it's going to cause the pain to go away. You take it, uh, and your brain is like, this is supposed to make the pain go away, and it actually can lower the experience of pain, even though you're still getting all of the same pain signals you were before. Um, distraction is a really good way of, of controlling pain. Draw your attention away from the painful stimulation, right? If you're sitting there and you're cut and you're just staring at the cut, it's going to hurt more than if you kind of like try to ignore it and or forget it. Um, fMRI scans reveal virtual reality play reduces the brain's pain-related re activity. This was awesome. They've been starting to use this for, especially for getting like kids' hospitals and things where kids are going through uh, procedures that are very uncomfortable or very painful. Um, they're able to, to, to basically put them in virtual reality situations, right? You got the little goggles and everything on. Um, and they play games and things, and the distraction basically causes, they still feel the pain, but it's the experience of it is reduced significantly. Um, hypnosis also seems to work. They need to do more research on this area, honestly. Um, hypnosis has kind of gotten black flag or blackballed uh, for, for years, about 200 years now. Um, it needs to be reopened for exploration because it really has, it has a potential for a lot of benefits. <clears throat> but... Um, hypnosis, why does it work? One is the potential of the social influence theory, right? Uh, people around you, maybe the hip, hypnotist is kind of like guiding you through it to some, to some sense. Um, disassociation, dual processing, where the brain is able to process more on different planes, right? Going at the same time. Um, so the ability to disassociate is a possibility here. Sensory information does not reach areas where pain related information is processed. You basically block it in the brain. And by doing that, you don't experience it. Okay. Um, selective attention, again, you can kind of focus on one thing and keep your mind off of the other, and so therefore it doesn't, doesn't touch you consciously. Um, <clears throat> and then the possibility of post-hypnotic suggestion, which is basically this like, kind of longer-term processing. Um, my grandfather actually lost his leg. He, he was in a train accident when he was younger uh, and lost a leg, and he had chronic pain, and he was able to use hypnosis on himself, he actually hypnotized himself. He was his doctor taught him how to do it, and he was able to block that chronic pain, uh, where he basically didn't experience it at all. He used it actually a lot as he got older. He, he used it a lot when he experienced different levels of pain for different reasons. He was able to essentially turn it off in his brain. Pretty cool. So, all right. <clears throat> Next random fact: one horse can actually be 
they have the power of 15 horsepower. Um, so the modern day horsepower, uh, one horsepower is about 746 watts, approximately. Um, a large horse can produce 15 of modern day horsepower. It, it was a term that was originally used um, in the late 1800s when they were first introducing new machinery besides horses. And so it was kind of like, how strong is it? Well, it's about as strong as a horse or as two horses or as five horses. And then it, it eventually became a set number. And that's what we have today. So one horse, one modern horse, like a draft horse or something, can produce up to 15 horsepower. There you go. Um, 18, the other senses, taste. Uh, like touch, taste involves several basic sensations. Okay. Uh, it can be influenced by learning, expectations, and perceptual bias. Right, The things that you like and don't like in taste uh, are, are going to be affected by basically how you are trained to, to interpret the sensations. Um, and there are several survival functions, right? So we have sweet, uh, which is an energy source. Anything that's sweet is generally going to be high in calories. Uh, you can find this list also on page 225. Um, salty is going to be sodium, which is essential to physiological processes, right? We need salt. If you don't have enough salt in your system, it's your, your system falls apart. If you have too much salt, it also causes a problem, but you, you need that. You need enough salt. Okay. So, and especially remember we're, we're dealing with ice age hardware in a modern world, right? There was a thousand years ago, you didn't just grab a shaker of salt on the table and, and put it on your food. Um, salt was hard to come by. And so that was important that you could detect that. And our brain is wired to like and want salt. Sweet, salt are going to be two of the main things that our brain wants. Umami is the other one. Umami is down at the bottom there. It, it, it indicates proteins, um, like uh, large levels of proteins that will grow and repair our tissues. Um, so those are the three things that we look for. Fat, right? Animal fat is going to be full of umami, um, as well as the meat and everything else. So, sour is is a potential of toxic acids levels, right? Um, so we have a tend a little bit of an aversion to sour naturally, um, but you can learn to enjoy it. So it's kind of that's a learned process. Bitter is potential poisons. Again, most people don't like bitter, um, but you can learn to enjoy it. Uh, a combination of these things, like if you, if you have some things that are sweet, but then you add some bitter, it can actually increase the sweetness or the experience of sweetness and things like that. So there's ways of doing this. Now, taste is different than flavor. Okay. Um, flavor is actually a combination of three elements. Flavor is a combination of taste, smell, and then feeling that or, or sensation that the feeling sensation of texture. Those three things combined produce flavor. Um, if you lose any one of those things, you've actually, you lose a large sense of the flavor, right? If you lose, like if you plug your nose, you still get taste. You can still tell it's salty. You can still tell it's sweet, but you get no flavor. That's because you've lost one of the elements. And same with like even the feeling of it, the, 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 uh, the texture sensation causes a big difference in how we experience flavor. Okay. I don't know if that's later on or not, but anyway, slide 19. Taste. Inside each little bump on the top and sides of the tongue are more than 200 taste buds. Each bud contains a pore with 50 to 100 taste receptors. These are essentially a little chemis chemistry lab. Um, it's going to be breaking down, looking for those specific chemicals that are going to cause the sensations of sweet, salty, bitter, sour, umami. Okay. Each kind of receptor reacts to different types of food molecules and sends messages to the brain. If, depending on which ones are overwhelming, will we'll basically give you that sensation. Okay. Um, quick note too, it is actually a, a falsehood that like when they, you've seen those old diagrams, I'm not even sure they do them anymore, but when I was a kid, they always had diagrams showing like, you know, this part of the tongue is where you taste salty and this is part of the tongue you taste sweet. That's bogus. Um, they're, they're actually pretty evenly spread out all over the tongue. Um, each bud actually can potentially even taste multiple chemicals, but inside the bud, right? And those little, there were those little, um, where, where, where the actual little receptors are, they will only react to a specific, uh, you know, salt or something like that, sweet or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, 20, the other senses, smell, uh, olfaction, experience of smell. So like taste, smell is a chemical sense. Okay. Uh, olfactory receptor cells are located in the olfactory bulb in the nose. It looks kind of like a clamshell actually kind of up in there. Uh, it's a combination of several odor molecules stimulate different receptors to detect them. Uh, so again, it's, it's a chemistry lab, basically. You, you're, you're inhaling the chemicals in the air, 
those little molecules are going to be either able to fit or not fit into certain receptor sites in, in the nasal passage. Um, if they fit, it causes a reaction that is then sent into the brain to be interpreted as smell. Okay, uh, these patterns are interpreted by the olfactory cortex then as, as the experience of smell. Uh, 21, on 21, you can see this image also on page 226. Um, but it shows kind of like a, a woman in sniffing a, uh, a flower, a rose. The, the molecules of that rose are actually going up into the nose, into the olfactory um, uh, bulb, which is then where all the olfactory nerves are located. As those mo molecules pass through, it, it basically tickles the, uh, the, the odorant receptor point portions of the nose, which then send... Uh, signals, neural signals up into the olfactory bulb, um, which is then connected to the nerves, which are then sent into the brain. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Take a look at that picture. That should help you out with that one. Slide 22, smell part one. The nose knows humans have some 20 million olfactory receptors, which is actually a pretty decent amount. Um, not compared to like bloodhounds and bears and things like that, but it's still a pretty decent amount overall. Bloodhound has 220 million um, olf or, 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 yeah, olfactory receptors, so they can they can pick up a lot fainter scents um, because they have a lot more recepting receptor sites to pick those up. Um, I was just looking to see if there's anything. I got some notes here. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Interestingly, the the the, the nerve. Um, do I have this in here? I don't, okay. I'm going to throw this out there. I think it's in the book too, but I, I want to make sure I, I touch on it though. Um, the, the pathway that the nerve takes to basically get into the brain goes right through the parts of the brain that are connected to memory and emotion. Um, our sense of smell has a stronger connection to those two factors because of that compared to any other sense, which is why you can suddenly get a smell, um, and it, it takes you immediately back to somewhere. Okay, example, me and a friend, we were, we were at a, a whiskey tasting um, and we were, we were smelling the different whiskeys and he smelled one of the whiskeys and he, he stopped and was like, I go, what's this smell like? And he goes, it smells like grandma. And I was like, it smells like grandma? Like was your grandma an alcoholic? And he's like, I don't know. He's like, but it immediately brought me to grandma's house. What, he, what we realized, we started exploring the whiskey um, it actually had, and it smells of cinnamon and nutmeg and for him cinnamon and nutmeg was his grandma's smell like that's what he associated with his grandma uh, and so that 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 when he, as soon as he had those notes boom he was back with grandma okay um, it was actually a very good whiskey also but anyway that's that's going to be the reason why um, and so if you if, if you pick up a different sense and things you, you might all of a sudden it'll take you back you know like that's why perfumes and, and things like that can have so much power on us um, is it we associate it with the people that wore them and things like that and so it'll trigger the memories of those people as well as the emotions that we felt with those people that can be good right like if you have a loving relationship with somebody and you smell something that smells like them and it pulls you to them like your grandma or something like that um, it can also be bad you know, you, you had a bad experience and there's a certain smell and then you smell that smell again and it can trigger the memory and the uh, emotional response to that, what had happened at that time. So, um, so yeah. Okay. Smell part two, slide 23. Uh, information from the taste buds travels to an area between the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. It registers in an area not far from where the brain receives information from our sense of smell, which interacts with taste. So they actually are gonna be interconnected with each other. Again, that's where our sense of flavor comes from. So the brain's circuitry for smell also connects with areas involved in memory storage, uh, which helps explain why smell can trigger memory. There you go, I forgot I had that there. So anyway, we'll keep on going. The other senses. Um, so those are your dominant senses, right? Sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of smell, sense of taste, sense of touch. Um, we have other senses that we don't usually refer to as much, okay? But in some ways, they're actually just as important or even more important in some cases. But um, kinesthesia is a system for sensing the position and movement of individual body parts. So it's, it's what allows us to move through our environment. Uh, it's also generally connected to our sense of vision. 
Okay. Um, but it, it's how we kind of, how you can maneuver through an environment without crashing into everything, essentially. Okay. Uh, if you tend to be rather clumsy or klutzy, uh, it can actually be a, a, a lack of kinesthetic, kinesthesia, ah, anyway, it's a lack of this. Um, it's a lack of kinesthesia. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> it, it, and essentially it, it's something that you need to work on and, and practice paying more attention to. Uh, and it, it can it can make your brain more connected to it. Um, the vestibular sense is a sense of body movement and position, including the sense of balance, which allows you to move through, uh, again, through your environment more effectively. Okay. Um, yeah, fun things you can do. You can like if you want to kind of work on it, you can do the hunting the rabbit. This is actually really good. And then you switch, and then you switch. And it's really hard. It looks super simple. If you really want to get confusing, you can also like fire the gun at the bunny, um, and it just, it, it blows your brain. Okay, that's one. Uh, rub, rubbing your stomach and patting your head. These things are all gonna be kind of helping you with your with the kinesthetic. You can also do, if you if you can if you can do it, if I can do it, um, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't, but you can do where you go like this. It's throwing me off because my camera is looking different, and then you can like act like this. You do this fast. Ah, I can't do it. Anyway. So you do the, the, you know, Vulcan, I do it better with my left hand. You do like the Vulcan sign, right? And then you do another one where it's like this and you pass them back and forth in between each other. Those things can actually help with uh, kinesthesia and vestibular senses. It basically improves uh, your, your hand-eye coordination as well as your ability to move through space. Okay. All right, 25, sensory interaction part one. The senses are not totally separate information channels, right? They're all, they're interacting with each other. Um, sensory interaction, the principle that one sense may influence another as when the smell of food influences our taste. Smell plus texture plus taste equals flavor. Vision plus hearing will interact oftentimes. Um, you, know, you hear something and you immediately look to see what it is that you just heard. Uh, and they're gonna be, all the senses are gonna be basically playing off each other. You, you feel a, you feel something. You immediately look to see what's causing the, the discomfort on your hand or whatever. Um, so that's going to be that part of that process. On the in the image here, you can also see this on page two twenty seven, um, where we that you can see the area where we process smell, and you can see that the area that we process taste. Basically, the pathway goes right through where we process smell, which is why those two interact uh, so deeply. Okay. Twenty six embodied cognition. Influence of bodily sensations, gestures, and other states on cognitive preferences and judgments. Um, for example, physical warmth may promote social warmth. Okay, if you feel warm and cozy, it makes you more social sociable. Um, there's a reason why, like, if you picture you want to hang out like in a cabin by the fire when there's a storm outside and all those kinds of things uh, with somebody that you love. Okay, um, that physical coziness is is then translated into an overall sense with that person. Um, social exclusion can literally feel cold. Our brain interprets it as if we were cold, if you are socially excluded from different things. Uh, political expressions may mimic body positions, <clears throat> leaning left, leaning right, all those kinds of things. When we say it, we tend to do it. Um, but yeah, so it, like if you give someone the cold shoulder, that's, that's where that expression comes from. There's actually physical reactions to it. We also experience uh, uh, social exclusion as physical pain. It's actually, in some ways, in cases, experiences more deeply than physical pain is. So keep that in mind. If you if you see somebody who's being treated poorly, reach out to them. You're, they're getting hurt in that moment. Okay. Um, 27, ESP, perception without sensation. Oh, this is one of those areas. There's actually, there's been a, an exceptionally large amount of research done on this. Um, specifically by like the CIA and different groups because they felt like this would be a very useful thing if it in fact works. Um, most relevant ESP claims are that telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition. ESP is studied by uh, parapsychologists, which are basically trying to look for like kind of like paranormal activity within the human body or human brain. Um, what do we think about it? Yeah, you know, it could be. It very well could be. Um, but at this point, scientifically speaking, there, there isn't enough proof to say, yes, it is a thing. Um, BIM, nine experiments seem to suggest participants could anticipate future events. Critics of that experiment, the methods of, or analysis reviewed as were pretty flawed. They didn't do a very good job with the study. 
most research psychologists and scientists are skeptical at best. Um, if, if, if you, yeah, I don't know if I had you watch that video or not. Maybe I'll throw that one on there too. There's a video by, um, oh shoot, what's his name? Randy, something Randy. He is a uh, magician, like does like side of hand tricks. And he has basically dedicated his life to to exposing frauds who are who are using um, claims of ESP type activities uh, to make a lot of money and, and cheat a lot of people. Um, he has a TED talk though where he talks about uh, basically some of the dangers of people making these claims. And he has right now he has a million dollars standing for anyone who can prove that they can do any of these things. Um, he has really simple tests. It's like if you like people who claim they see auras and things like that. He's like, so you can see my aura above my head, for example, right? And you, people are like, yeah, I can see it. You know, you're, you're this. He goes, all right, all you have to do is tell me where I'm standing behind this wall. And the wall is just like an inch taller than my head because they claim that, you know, the aura signs this much higher. All you have to do is tell me where I'm standing behind the wall and you get a million dollars. So far, no one has claimed a million dollars. Um, you know, so so at this point, it, it lends itself towards... Uh, charlatanism rather than truth although the potential is that it is in fact a thing um so you know take that one with a big old grain of salt if you will but um interesting stuff possibly real mm, scientifically more than likely not at this point at least okay uh, but maybe they'll change it up all right last random fact all the paint on the eiffel tower weighs as much as about 10 elephants there you go. Eiffel Tower's paint is really heavy. Um, and that's it. That is that this is that module in a nutshell. So so make sure you read through it. Uh, again, a reminder to do both quizzes for this uh, for this module. If you have any questions, message me. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful day. The, we'll be moving into modules 19 and 21 next, through 21 next. Um, so there's no jump in this case. So if you want to read ahead, you can start reading on those modules um, as we go. It's going to be on how we learn, um, which can be very useful if you're a student. So, which as you are. And I will see you all in the next video. Have a wonderful day, evening, whatever time it happens to be that you're watching this. And I will see you in the next video.